Jonathan Reynolds is a Labour MP and is the Shadow Secretary of State for Business. Today, he reveals some of the home truths about being a politician. I think esteem at which politicians are held in has, has declined. Um... Earlier this year, we were joined by former Tory Business Secretary of State, Grant Chaps. So I was keen to invite Jonathan on as well. I first got to know Johnny a bit when we attended various events together between 2016 and 2019 in my capacity as a number 10 advisor and in his capacity as the shadow minister for the City of London. He was well regarded in the city, with City AM editor Christian May describing him as popular in the square mile and at home in the brief and we shared a bit of commonality about our backstory too. So I was born in 1980 in the, in the kind of the, the coal mining side of mm. Sunderland. All the family were miners and were Brandad was the winding engine man who controlled the lift shaft. I'm now joined by Johnny Reynolds for a discussion on politics, change and the north of England. Johnny, welcome to Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. Thank you. Really pleased to be here. Now, we have a interesting guest alumni of Jimmy's Jobs in common. You went round uh, to see Miles Jacobson at Football Manager the week after we interviewed him. What were your impressions of that company? Well, it was tremendous. Um, like uh, many people, I'm sure listening to this, um, there's a personal connection to that. I mean, I, I remember, that, uh, I'm going to feel old now, but when the first edition of what I think was Championship Manager, yeah. 95, and I thought, this is the most revolutionary thing I'd ever seen. I love football, obviously, but I thought this is like a game where, you know, the human isn't really mm. required, right? It's like a world that they have created. So there's a sort of personal uh, interest in that, but to see also what Miles was talking about in terms of what that company has done, mm. how they have, you know, created a product with this incredible following, but also, I mean, specific to, to what we're talking about today, the, the skill side, Miles' passion for that. I mean, I would have enjoyed the visit, I think, in any circumstances. I think that maybe they were taken away by some of the particularly detailed questions about the game in the world. <laughs> yeah. That they've created, you know, how can we model inflation better in football managers? Probably not the kind of question that they're, that they're used to uh, in the main, but I'm not real brilliant. And I, and a serious part of that is, you know, I, I think you would very much agree with this, that to take something like that, that is surely a great way we could educate people, inspire people yeah. about the kind of careers that are available and how the entry points into those uh, careers can actually be, you know, quite, quite open. There are people passionate about, about passing on that expertise. And knowledge, and of course, ultimately, it's just an absolutely world-class product that is yeah. known around the world. And I mean, some of the stories, I will give away the identities, but um, I'd never realized some professional footballers who come to the UK use Football Manager to learn English, to learn the kind of idioms around football language, because oh, yeah, yeah, if you yeah. think about it, you can put it in you know, your own language, change it, recognize what's happening, yeah, yeah. I mean, things like that. I mean, that's an aside, but I mean, a, a brilliant visit, it was definitely in my top three. In yeah. the ones I've done in this job. I always remember me of a story of Robbie Keane telling Rafa Benitez that he was glad he got the monkey off his back with his goal scoring and Rafa Benitez has been incredibly confused by it. <laughs> but yeah, you can see why the sort of the colloquial language around it would be interesting. What, what are the other sort of memorable visits you've had to businesses? Which well, I mean, I always say I, in a job like this, you can visit pretty much any business mm. in the UK, actually any business around the world. Now, Nobody in politics wants to be the opposition, but if you can't make the most of an opportunity like that, if you cannot, you know, use that to learn things, but also to develop good policy, you know, you'd be missing a huge opportunity. So the ones that are particularly special, I mean, I, I, I've lived my adult life, I'm very proud to represent part of, of the east side of Manchester and Thames side, but I grew up in Sunderland. So the Nissan car factory, um, yeah. one of my early visits, I mean, I've, I've friends from school who still work uh, there again. The senior management there are people who started in the main as apprentices. I mean, what, what an amazing story. It's, it's an amazing story about British exports and expertise and engineering mm -hmm. know-how as well. So that is, um, that is always a special one. I quite recently went to Scotland's biggest Pecora factory. Um, again, I just, I love to learn about how things are made, about the yeah. story of how businesses have grown. You know, why did people choose to do that? How, how did they come together? And I think. It's a bit like being an MP generally, really. If, you, if you're genuinely interested in people uh, and you want to learn and you're quite passionate about it, I find that people are incredibly welcoming. Whatever their own politics or how they see the, the situation in the UK right now, they, they really do respond well to, you know, if you're coming at it with some passion. And I, I find that bit of the joke. 
great. What uh, what else strikes you about the the northeast and the kind of jobs that are being created up there? Because it does perhaps sort of it is a bit underestimated, perhaps in in the UK. Perhaps it likes that a little bit sometimes, but. What have your reflections been on that? You're obviously born in Sunderland and so on. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think the North is a very distinct part of the country. You know, some very specific house prices are slightly, you know, even lower than Northwest in mm. the Northeast, and therefore you've got a kind of different, you know, how the economy works is very different. You know, we've, we've seen age become quite a significant factor in voting intention. You've got mm. a lot of people now with certain will pay off their mortgage earlier because house prices are less and, you know, the, the big thing I take from, from my experiences is, I mean, I, so I was born in 1980 in the, in the kind of the, the coal mining side of mm-hmm. Sunderland, plus to County Durham, traditional story, traditional labor story, you know, all the family were miners and my granddad was the winding engine man who controlled the lift shaft, you know, all, oh, all, all of that stuff. And I, I, one really big thing for me is cause I grew up at that time of, it was quite a time of significant change. I mean, shipbuilding and mining yeah. were, were the uh, core industries, you know, well, industrial action, the, the politics of the minor strike and, and so forth. And you know, very significant Northeast shipbuilders, I think employed 13,000 people, even by the end of its time in the, in the late 1980s. So I am one of those people who is, I'm, I'm not nostalgic for the past. You know, I think there's far too much nostalgia in British politics. It's a very powerful, emotional tool. Mm. But I do think the job of government of the state is, is to help people manage change. It's not to pretend that change isn't going to happen and you can somehow insulate yourself from it. No one should believe that's possible or even desirable, actually. But I, I do think how we are, and we'll see this challenge now, particularly around net zero, you know, going to make sure we get the maximum benefits of that. We're not just going to let people yeah. sink or swim around that. And, and you know, specific role for the state, I, I look now, you know, automotive obviously has to transition to, in the main, electric vehicle production. You know, that's going to require a partnership. Some welcome news recently, but it's been quite a worrying picture. We've also got things. Obviously, like Brexit affects the yeah. automotive sector very much. We, you know, if you if you think about the steel industry, again, it's maybe not thought it was an industry of the future in some quarters, but that's yeah. not a sunset industry. I mean, steel is integral yeah. to a modern economy. How are we going to move from you know a position where often the coverage of, of the UK steel industry is, isn't positive? It's a sort of talk of you know how we're going to get through the next year, and but actually with a partnership with the government and. and the kind of public-private arrangements that other countries have done would be a massive future for green steel. So I, I, I really, a, a lot of how I am approaching this job, as well as maybe the specific parts of individual policies, that's the kind of Very big thing that drives me. I, I do think that's important. And what, what, what does the Northeast specialise in now when it comes to the economy, right? Because a lot of people do still sort of associate it with coal mining, shipbuilding, et cetera. What are the sectors that you see up there now? Well, I mean, I... I think people maybe think a bit less about things like uh, shipbuilding now, but I, I do think yeah. the Nissan car factory has, has become the iconic, certainly for, for, the, for the weir side, side of the region, the, the iconic um, uh, image of it. I mean, a lot of people don't know that despite the, the wider sort of economic position of the Northeast, it is the only region of England outside the Southeast that has a net export, mm. you know, balanced trade, which is, which is astonishing, but mainly that is the automotive sector. You know, there are, there are things now around, um, whether it is game production or the creative industries in particular, which have absolutely you know soared, or on the back of good connections to, to higher education in the northeast, which are really important, professional services like every part of the country, particularly around Newcastle, is a really big part of that. But one of my feelings is that I don't know whether some people may agree with this; they they may not, but I think sometimes as a country we're not as aware of, as we need to be of what we actually do do well. Yeah. You know, I, I'll go around my own constituency, you know, some, some of the things we've got going on in the industrial estates are absolutely amazing, but they're, they're out of sight. I mean, you, know, you don't really go to an industrial estate unless you've got a reason to visit yeah, yeah. somewhere else some business to conduct. And so, of course, it's not the days when you had, you know, an area like Staley Bridge and High that I live and represent in, you literally had big mills dominating the landscape, clocking off time, everyone leaving and coming at the same time. That's a very visible, you know, sign of how your economy works. I actually think we need to tell them maybe a, a better story about what we're good at. I think particularly if we look at the politics and future of, of things like trade deals, you know, you've got to base that on how can you maximize your strengths, your competitive advantages. So it's often covered in the press here in terms of sort of a trade deal where we looked at in terms of are, are we getting more than the country we're doing that deal with? Well, actually, it's, it's more about your internal yeah. economic picture, isn't it? So it's what sectors are we willing to take a bit more competition in to gain more trade access for because we think we're particularly good at it and know we could gain something from there. And 
maybe that needs to catch up a little bit. What companies have kind of impressed you that uh, that you've been on sort of your travels and you meet with, with lots of people who have kind of impressed you? Because I'm always struck by, you know, quite often businesses don't necessarily engage with government. And if they're B2B businesses, well, they don't necessarily get profile in the media either, right? So actually there's lots of these stories that just aren't, aren't really told, aren't really covered. So it'd be quite interesting which ones you sort of call those. I think that's true. I mean, I am often surprised by how, I mean, some businesses are brilliant at their engagement yeah. you know, in terms of they're not, not, not in terms of they're asking for things, they're just telling you what they're doing, what that means, what the, what the competitive position around the world is, you know, and that, that is genuinely useful. There right. are also, I would say businesses that have a, you know, a, 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 a situation where they're, they're incredibly, I wouldn't say exposed, but you know, their business relates quite a lot to the public policy environment mm. and, and the wider state of the uh, economy. So you'd think they would be more engaged in terms of what they are, you know, just putting through to parliamentarians, not even front benches, but you know, parliament as a, as a whole to make sure that policy is good, basically, that, that yeah. it's effective and it does the thing. So, I mean, I, it's always difficult to single people out, but I, I mean, I, I am, look, I, I try and avoid something which I think maybe people who I've seen do the job of business secretary fall into, which is to sort of say, these are, these are the people I like. And I, and I think some of the debate is, mm. it is completely false. I mean, you, you even get people, you know, should the UK focus on services or manufacturing? I mean, of course you should have a good policy platform for poor. Yeah. If you wouldn't, no one chooses those things or, you know, the worst one is when, you know, we should like small businesses, not big businesses. Well, I mean, what does that? Yeah, mean, should you want successful businesses to grow to employ more people? Some of the best employment in the UK is in larger businesses. That you know, again, we all want competitive markets where new entrants, smaller businesses, can compete. But they've, they've got to do that on on quality and you know how that works. And obviously, you've got to make sure there's a fair, you know, things like late payment for small businesses. That that's a genuine yeah. problem in the UK and, and and does need specific policy focus. But I mean, I I, I can honestly, I'm impressed and enthusiastic about almost anyone I go see. And sometimes there are conversations that, that are tougher. You know, yeah. I mean, there are, you know, I absolutely believe, for instance, every business in the country should be comfortable about letting its workforce join a trade union and, and collectively organize if that's yeah. um, what that workforce choose to do. And actually there's a lot to be gained for the business from doing that. I think most people accept that. If they don't, I would have that conversation with them. But I, I can honestly say I enjoy almost every visit I go on. How do you think the future of work is changing? Because there's there's a lot in that, isn't there, post the pandemic, people wanting flexibility, working from home, etc. I mean, the Labour Party was literally founded off jobs and uh, and that kind of like collective bargaining and so forth. How do you think the future looks when it comes to that? Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a, a set of trends that I would say have been accelerated by mm. the pandemic, but still. I think some of the media commentary can be overdone. So, I mean, I, I think back to when I was a, a trainee solicitor and there was part of that job, which was a lot of processing, you know, yes. <laughs> go, go through these leases, you know, and, and actually a world where you could have some flexibility and, and do that as part of your week, but, but maybe do it from home. Yeah. That would be absolutely, would have been absolutely brilliant. Obviously a big part of a job like that is learning from people who've got more experience than you. So, yeah. you know, you do need to be in the office to get that. You need to be part and observe and, and be able to ask people are kind of critical questions that will develop your own career. And so actually I, I talk to most you know, businesses and I, and I don't see them going completely one way or the other yeah. on the, the state of the labor market and how tight it is means that people do have certain expectations and they will ask for certain flexibilities, but I think that can work for the employer. Yeah. But the idea that we're all going to work from home and there's going to be no commercial property anymore and the tax base is going to collapse or, or that, you know, on the other extreme, some of the government secretaries of state, I've shadowed it. We, one in particular, Jacob rees I think went around putting notes on civil servants' yeah. desks telling them, uh, you know, they had to get back to work and probably didn't do very much for recruitment yeah. and morale, I'd imagine, for the people who were on the receiving end of that. I mean, that, that's, that's too much on the other extreme. I think businesses can work this out with their own workforce for themselves. But, you know, expectations have, have changed around that. Because, you know, obviously living in, in Greater Manchester and you know, the strength of Manchester City Centre in particular is, is, a, is a great regeneration story led by, you know, local labor politicians now for, for many years, I, I do ask people, you know, I, I, you just lose. if you think about the Circle Square developed in Manchester, which is where the BBC used yeah. to be, you know, are you worried about how the trend has changed? But actually they say people will still, you know, even if they're not going to be in every day, they want a premium workplace to come into, you know, and, they want that environment. 
and, and on Manchester kind of specifically, because it's a great case study of how a city has kind of come sort of roaring back, has got kind of lots of creative industries and so on. What do you put that down to? You've been the MP since 2010. What is that sort of, why is Manchester booming so much? Well, uh, I mean, first of all, you've got to credit some of the people who began that process. That's uh, Howard Bernstein, who was yeah. the chief executive for a long time, and Richard Lease as, as leader, and actually Graham Stringer before that. I mean, I, I was once at the Royal Exchange uh, in Manchester, which is, um, it's the old cotton exchange for yeah. people who don't know, and it still has the kind of prices up in a wonderful theatre to visit. But I was sitting next to Graham, just by coincidence, and I said, um, you must have been the leader when, when this work began. And he said, you know, people said, leader after you know, five o'clock, no one is going to want to come into a northern British city centre. Yeah. And, and now not only do they want to, they live there. And so, you know, it's, yeah. it's not, first of all, it's not short-term initiatives. It's a long-term planning. It is a commitment to, to place making. I mean, you know, when I was a trainee in the legal sector in Manchester, um, Spinning Fields was just starting to, to get up and, and going now again, a hugely thriving sector. They've really gone for the big, big decisions, bold decisions, but also, you know, they have, they have based it on not just, you know, say jobs alone. It's about people living there as well. And, and, and actually a, the creative sector is, is clearly very strong and that the, the anchor for that has been the, the relocation of the BBC and that's actually in Salford Keys, but has a huge effect on, on the city centre as well. But they, they have, you know, linked those initiatives consistently over time. And, and, I, and I do think the levelling up agenda is interesting. The white paper is interesting that the government did, but the kind of commitment and resources and long, you know, long-term commitment you need to that it is what will ultimately do it. And of course, once you get that, you get this incredibly benign and positive reinforcing set of relationships, which is more, more people want to live there. Yeah. That talent base of young you know, well-educated, committed people. Of course, you will want to base your business there if you get access to that talent pool. I mean, more, more than anything else, because I'm always asking businesses, what will make you invest more in the UK? What yeah. decisions are borderline? That, 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 you know, what policy environment could I provide that would bring you over the line to do it? And at the top of everything is going to be, is there a committed, skilled workforce? And on, on the inward investment side as well, like, you know, to flip to the other end of the country now, London and the stock exchange, like there's some big challenges around that at the moment. And you talk there about like, you know, momentum carrying a city one way or the other, like London's got some challenges at the, at the moment. What are you hearing when you're speaking to the international investors side? Um, yeah. So, I mean, this is the, the, the position, you know, around financial services and the post Brexit picture for the city has obviously been a really strong topic of, of mm. conversation politically and, you know, it's never, I think, been the worry that it would have, the Brexit would have created some kind of, you know, exodus of all the jobs. I mean, this is not how it's going to be, but I think what worries people is, and the language they will use is the slow puncture. So over time, your competitiveness is, is yeah. removed and obviously that agglomerative effect of having so many thriving sectors that makes this, you know, the number one financial center as we would want it to be, it, it is the worry. And specifically, I mean, I think the bit we've all got to be aware of, particularly the concerns around you know, the desirability or otherwise of listing in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we have such a thriving fintech sector in particular, and you know, we've got innovation, we've got great universities. But if it's getting to a point where, you know, at a certain point of success, people just don't want to then take the next step in the UK, that, that, that is a problem. Yeah. And I, and I think the reason, I mean, we've got things like the Edinburgh reforms the government have done, which are, you know, a set of kind of regulatory changes to increase the desirability. They're of interest, but the thing that worries me the most is when people say to me that culturally they feel the U.S. values, particularly technology companies, better, and that they're more patient for longer-term returns, a longer-term growth, essentially, over shorter-term yeah. returns. Now, when people are assigned to you a cultural problem, and there's no obvious regulatory lever to, to pull to do that, that's got to be a concern. I think there's there's a lot of activity around this. It's it's broad. I mean, people may know of the um, things like the financial services and markets bill this government did was, was broadly supported by the Labour opposition mm. here. I mean, we we backed the secondary objective in terms of competitiveness for the regulator. So the, the, there is a, a pretty healthy cross party conversation going on about this. But you know, I, I think we've got to we've all got to be alert to these concerns because there's some brilliant, brilliant things here. This is I will yeah. say. That the big picture has got to be a recognition that there are some brilliant sectors, brilliant firms, things in this country that every other country is envious of and would like. But you shouldn't, as a as a 
as a cabinet minister, as a business secretary in particular, just go, look, I, I can go along to a world-class place. There's nothing to see here. You've got to go, you've got yeah. to go along and say, because of this, and I know how good we can be, I am inspired to make sure the whole of the economy is aspiring to live up to this ideal. And, and there are some policy challenges, particularly around what you've just said, yeah. And how do we encourage people to be more ambitious with their businesses and to grow and to, to scale more? Because that's one of the big challenges, right, is we need more scale. We've got quite a lot of startups, actually, but how do you get people scaling? Yeah, I mean, we did a piece of work, which we uh, think is very important, which is our startup scale-up report mm. that Lord Jim O'Neill did for us. And, I mean, because of the different shadow jobs I've done, it's, it's a question I've thought about quite a lot. Person says there are. I mean, there are businesses who just don't want to go beyond a certain point. They are. They are happy with the yeah. the income return that they are getting. They're worried about loss of control around that, and I, I understand that there is still not as much as there was. You know, for a while there was a a real hangover from the the financial crisis and what had to happen is as, as banks tightened up their balance sheets and unfortunately some actually you know, outright illegal behaviour, which became some of the scandals at the at the time um, and the conversation that had to come from that. So there is that part of the question. I do think there's a set of things in terms of, again, you're, you're always looking for, that we all cease to analyze the problem, what's going to make a real difference? Yeah. So that report in particular talks about how we could evolve the British Business Bank into build on some of the good work it's done, you know, give it some, some real strength, institutional independence around how it deploys capital and, and the programs that it runs, really tailoring those specific regions and parts of the country, as they've started to do, to be fair. And, you know, I think yeah. that is an interesting bit, how... You know, some of the um, uh, investment reliefs like Enterprise Investment Allowance you know, uh, Scheme, how, how can that work better? How can we perhaps give some more confidence and longevity to some of those programs? So we are looking around this, but culturally we have to value people who do it. I do think that has changed in the, in the UK in the last few years. I think the, I suppose in many ways that when I talk to some tech companies or people who call themselves or probably rightly call themselves tech entrepreneurs, really they're creating content mm. and tech is the, is, the, is the means by which they are marketing that. Yes. And, and so I think one interesting thing that that has done, I remember talking to some, some brilliant group of, it was a specific group of, of female tech entrepreneurs in, in Bonded Warehouse in Manchester, which is one of our uh, facilities, you know, great place to network and be part of and grow your business. And I was thinking that, you know, there are people here telling me because of technology, they can be self-employed, they can be innovators, they, they can create products and be entrepreneurial because that path existed. It didn't, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, there, would, there simply wouldn't have been a way to break off on your own and, and do that. So we've got to, we've got to harness that energy yeah. and, and that, that potential. Tell people it's possible. Now, the best way to do that, I think, is obviously peer-to-peer -peer yeah. support. I mean, like, you know, a cabinet minister telling you you should do this, that's, that's never, that's never what we're hearts and minds in quite the same way. But if you meet someone who, who has a similar background to you, who's interested in the same thing as you, and they're telling you their story, which is really what a lot of those kind of mentorships and, and peer programs do. I, I think that, yeah. That's do, you think, do you think we could have a bit more kind of coverage in, in the media and, and culturally as well? I mean, there's things like The Apprentice and Dragon's Den. Yeah, were there things like that that could be out there that could encourage British business a bit more? I think the impact of high profile role models and particularly, I mean, podcasts like this, it's, this is an enormous growing sector as yeah. where I think that helps. I think it really does. I think you, we need also, you know, this could be quite rightly. I think there is a, a recognition that, you know, not everyone has to become a national, you know, television yeah, yeah. media personality. You know, that success has many forms around it, but I, I, I do think when we're talking about how work has changed as well, in terms of the autonomy and you know, maybe a bit more control over people's working lives that a lot of people are seeking. It fits very well yeah. with the kind of, you know, lifestyles. I mean, it's, to be clear, it's very hard work and a lot of people will end up with, at times, a lot of personal pressure, sleepless nights as they're, yeah. as they're developing and taking personal risk around that. So it's not an easy life, but I, I think it can be a very rewarding one that can match what people are looking for. Um, and how do you sort of like when you became shadow business secretary how did you kind of approach the job because you were the shadow city minister under jeremy corbyn which is not an easy job in some ways given what jeremy corbyn had kind of said about the financial services and and so on but actually you were quite well liked by the city and uh, so on you know city am described you as being well liked at home and abroad how do you approach a new job when you get it, what's your, what's the Johnny Reynolds working methods? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I remember taking on the shadow city job and thinking, because obviously it was, it was the time of the Brexit negotiations, parliament was yeah, completely yeah. in paralysis, couldn't, couldn't vote for any, even its preferred option, everything, you know, failed at that hurdle. So it was a really challenging time. And I thought, look, I, 
uh, people may know, you know politically, I wouldn't be associated with that side of the party with Jeremy. So it was quite a big decision to to be part of it. But I, I do believe in public service. I do believe if you're coming mm -hmm. here to Parliament. Obviously, your, your top job is represent your constituents. But this was a time where, you know, first of all, the opposition did need to understand financial services and did need to have good dialogue with them. And, and that ideally, you know, the trade and cooperation agreement that was signed, it wasn't a hugely favorable one for yeah. the financial sector. It, it, it needed, people need to understand that and the potential consequences of that. I, I, I often think, first of all, you've got to decide what is the, what's the strategic thing you're trying to do? I mean, of course, you're going to cover debates here. You're going to respond when the minister responds. What are you trying to do? So that was the challenge around that job. With having had that experience in particular, you know, I wanted essentially the business job because I wanted the old view on the labor side of the entire business engagement and relationship that we had. And so I think, first of all, there was an overwhelming need to, to build our relationships with the business community better, yeah. to um, engage in all sectors, to make sure not just that the business team were doing that, but the whole of the party, the front bench, you know, was the common script and messages that we were doing and getting out there. But also, I mean, if, if you look at, I mean, look at the, look at the big challenges, any, anyone who wins the next election, what are the big challenges they will face? Well, look, the fact is since the financial crisis, this country's economic performance has not yeah. been what it needs to be. You know, as an objective statement in terms of the growth, productivity in particular, wages, and that's why there's the you know, little industrial action is, it comes to, down to that and the cost of living. We clearly have to, you know, get that post-Brexit relationship and future right in terms of relationships around the world and our relationship with the EU. Net zero is coming to the crunch point. Yeah, yeah. What we've done so far has not been easy, but it is the easier bits, things like industrial decarbonization a lot harder. And of course, then we've seen this massive change in the, in the global picture, the Inflation Reduction Act, the investment that's gone to the, the, the US as a result of that. So I would say not only does an opposition and incoming government always need a good relationship with business, I would say you can't tackle any of those challenges. You genuinely yeah. can't, but unless you're building that up. And I suppose ultimately, I believe we're getting towards a place, and this is my objective, where any business looking at the prospect of a general election next year will say, well, you know, not only is there no risk premium associated with a, with a Labour government taking over, we're more excited about Labour's plans yeah. than we are you know, of, of a fifth term of Conservative government. So that is what we're trying uh, to do. Um, you know, the response from businesses, again, I think if you, if you come up with that genuine enthusiasm, that's all, that's all that's that they want. But I, I do think on particularly industrial strategy on making Brexit work, and our plans to change the apprenticeship levy and the planning system yeah. and, the, and the regulation on national grid connections. I do think all of these things are of reflecting the, the genuine things that are currently barriers to investment in the UK. Um, and what are the sort of the three things that get brought up most by business? I mean, I know you, you've talked a bit about kind of political instability being the number one, which I think everyone can kind of like yeah, yeah. can see that over the last year. But what, what are the other things that sort of businesses say? actually be really helpful to get government's support yeah. on this or so, so stability is what they raise first of all and that's obviously a, a reflection of yeah. we had a year with three prime ministers i mean it's a, it's a reasonable complaint about the political system if, if that is where it is but they also mean in terms of look the investment periods for some of those net zero questions you know the incentives and the relative trade-offs of making those investments in the uk they do need reassurance that you will not see policy change yeah. in response to short-term political pressure. So I also remember being the shadow energy minister in 2015. Um, uh, the, the eco program is a big home in, insulation yeah. program. I mean, it, it lasted less than a calendar year. It is reasonable for businesses to complain yeah. if the political system is, you know, is not giving them the, the, the timeframes that they need. That is always the first one. Skills will be the next one. Yeah. Uh, and um, obviously we have plans to change the apprenticeship levy, give businesses more control, more flexibility really over how they spend that, but also it's often a question of, okay, they want that resource. They really like that policy. Will the quality be there? Will it be available in which to use that? Um, you know, it's been a very hard time for FE. And if I was saying the third one, it would either be planning uh, or it would be things like national grid and the inability to get connections, mm. which has become a huge issue in, in terms of, again, yeah. delaying uh, those investments, large and small, from pubs to, to gigafactories, that's coming through there. So, you know, I'm, uh, there's a little bit of commentary now in the, in the, in the media, which is there was a change of government. It's not going to be a lot of money to spend because things are tight. Yeah. What, what can change? Well, actually, I would say on things like negotiating a better Brexit agreement, the planning system, allowing people to make those investments, changing business rates is a, is a big one of our policies, how the apprenticeship levy functions. Actually, you know, there are things yeah, you can do. do. Let's not get into a, you know, we do have a commitment to greater public investment around leveraging in private investment around net zero. But you know, let's be clear, there are, there are some big things that can be done that I think would improve the UK's relative position quite a lot. 
And when it comes to skills, let's just dive into that for a bit. What what are the skills that people are short of? What do you think are sort of, you know, the challenges in the next 20, 30 years? And- I mean, in terms of how daunting some of the challenges are, this is one of the, the biggest, because I think the UK has simultaneously got skill shortages. It's yeah. got labor shortages, which is a distinct but related issue. And it's got net immigration at record levels. Now that's yeah. in political terms, that is a challenge for businesses. That is, that is a challenge in terms of getting that. But I... I mean, in any sector I talk to, from hospitality to manufacturing and engineering, they're talking about skills shortages. I think, first of all, aside from questions about numbers in terms of immigration, the system has to work better in terms of how fast and responsive it is. Yeah. We have you know, something called the shortage occupation list. There are, there are roles on there that have been on for over a decade, you know, the, the sense that it's not dynamic and yeah, yeah. to need. And of course, because some of the things haven't changed, well, genuine shortages, I mean, we one of the big losses from the end of freedom of movement has been that more kind of technical shop floor role that Eastern Europe yeah. had a lot of people coming to the UK. I mean, but one in 10 of, at one time of the manufacturing workforce w- would have come from there. Obviously some of that has been closed off. We've got very high migration from say, uh, Nigeria or India, often that's maybe, maybe more on the social care side. And so you know, this is the challenge immigration hybrid. It's not, it's not replacing, it's a different, yeah. it's a different cohort, very welcome, very good, but still. You know, it's, it's a different question, therefore, and uh, I do think there's ways the system can work better. I, I do think fundamentally for, for, for my constituents, they do know and they do celebrate that immigration will always play a role in filling some of those shortages. All, all they want to know is it's not going to be the only way to do that. And the reason we've got that policy around flexibility in the apprenticeship levy, which will become a skills levy, is that, look, at the minute, if you're spending 100% of your levy on, on, on apprenticeships, brilliant, that you won't be affected. By giving you the right to spend up to half of it on other forms of training, you know, which would be approved forms of training, yeah. but you know, that could be the more, well, it could be anything, but it could be you know, the shorter forms of, of access to particular skills and training, which actually, I mean, I'm always amazed how quickly businesses themselves can get people up to speed. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's just very really more that, more businesses sort of. I think how, you know, if you look at some of the major tech companies, they have in-house skills and training programs mm. that they've pitched ideas to me and to uh, Bridget uh, Phillips in our education uh, shadow around, you know, how could that be made perhaps more available? How could some of that be joined up? Or how could some of the basis of that be done? Now you, you've got to get that right because they've got business needs and you know, some of them have put huge resources into developing that. But I do think you've got to ask you, if you need to know something, see, is this a job around yeah. the house? What would you do? Probably Google it, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. It's the starting point. I mean, I, um, yeah, I'm just thinking that the other I asked thing. in YouTube stuff. I think yeah, I, I, I looked at a video how to change a particular type of toilet seat on on YouTube. It's it's the go to way to go, and the fact that there are there are ways to deliver training to people mm. in a in a much more, I suppose, available way. That that's got to be something that we think's a good thing. So I, the whole range of skills that people need, there's different ways to get that. I mean, with skills now sitting, at, unlike the Labour government, skills obviously sits in the education department rather than me. Don't quite get to, to, to lead on that in the same yeah. way, but the business voice and relationship into that has got to be key. The other thing I'd say is, I, I think having those national changes to the apprenticeship level, you're completely consistent with devolving some of the control over that to, to parts of the country. So yeah. in Greater Manchester, we've already got the devolution of skills in FE. You know, what, what Andy Burnham's mayor is looking at is how, how could you specialize some of our FE colleges? Yeah. Key thing there is a transport system that lets young people go. Yeah. You know, exactly. move around. By heart. So, you know, so, so local control of, of say the bus routes was, was an essential part of that, a, a pass for young people to mm. access at a, at, a, at a reasonable way. Public transport to do that had to be sorted out first, but actually you, what I see you'd want in a, in a city like Greater Manchester is not 10 places trying to do exactly the same. It's going to be some commonality, mm-hmm. but you know, the, the, the way we could link in the business community to specialize some of those places to do that, which is what Andy's talking about. I think that would really improve the, the, the product that could be available. Yeah, and it, the, the MBAC thing that he's looking at, uh, yeah, I think is quite interesting in terms of like, well, Manchester is specific. We need these specific skills and, and people take a bit more ownership of it. I want to talk about your career and so on. So you mentioned a couple of times uh, you were a trainee solicitor, trainee in the legal sector. Um, why did you choose that? Well, I was, I think I always wanted sort of clear profession, you know, not just mm. a job, a profession. And my route into law, a little bit uh, complicated. I mean, I, I, so I left the Northeast. I went to Manchester mm. University, loved Manchester. Great time, you know, 
first class degree, elected the student union, you know, all, all of those classic, yeah. you know, university things. Um, slight change of plan. Uh, my um, eldest son was born just after I graduated. So it wasn't, wasn't yeah. quite the case of being able to go straight uh, to law school. I had to wait a few years and, and make sure the family situation was, was able to, to do that. So when I went, I, you know, I, I really had to wait and think about it. And I, um, uh, you know, I loved every minute of it because it, the, the pressure was on you when, you, when you're going to go to back into to education and you've got children already, you, yeah, it's much more serious. I mean, you, you know, how you may be approached your undergraduate years, it's, it's not uh, the same, but I, uh, got my training contract with Adelshaw Goddard, you, you are one of the, the, the most famous firms in Manchester yeah. really in the legal sector. So it was, you know, and the chance to, it was a job where, first of all, it's, I mean, it's, it's not quite as diverse and different as being an MP where things can change every day, but. Again, you're dealing with a whole range of businesses. Um, you know, I remember, you know, some of those clients, you know, the ones like the cooperative group, um, uh, they were doing a big acquisition at the time, but, you know, I think the first deal I was ever kind of really allowed to, to take a, a lead on was a telecoms acquisition. You know, and you learned all about those different sectors. Yeah, yeah. And I actually, I was, a, I was a local counselor in my area at the same time as I was doing that. So I was, a you know, I saw that in ways it, you know, strength and weaknesses of both public sector and private sector. And I, I think in politics, we could do with maybe a bit more people who appreciate the strength and weaknesses of both oh, worlds. Yeah. It, it, it just, just doesn't tend to work out that way for most people, but for obvious reasons, your career goes in a, in a direction, but I, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. I probably would have, you know, almost certainly stayed with Alisho, hopefully, you know, got a job in the corporate team on M&A and things like that. But, um, I became in a people accident in, in really in the 2010 election. My own constituency had a vacancy, very, you know, short notice was that being a young counselor, you know, yeah, yeah. The, the choice of really my, my friends and in, in the local area and, and very few people, if I'm being honest, get to be the MP for the area they already live. I think a lot of people don't quite mm. appreciate this, but you, you would usually choose to want to do it. You go and find somewhere that needs a candidate. You either have to inherit it yeah. from someone who's retiring or, or beat an opponent to do it. When you get a chance and it's, it's where you live, where your friends are. I mean, it's an amazing opportunity. So I, I never regretted it, but I would have been, you know, still very much in, involved and um, yeah, connected to my friends who my fellow trainees at that. They're all partners now in law firms. Um, and <laughs> so they're doing very well. you were 29 when you were elected, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there was a lot of, there was a lot of change in 2010. It was after the expenses crisis. A lot of people had stood yeah, down yeah. Uh, for various uh, reasons, but I, but we certainly hadn't expected my MP at the time to, to stand down. So it really was a short notice thing. Um, so, you know, they were, they were, they were, I mean, the youngest MP at the time was, was Pam Nash, I think it was maybe 21 oh, yeah. or 22. Um, though re relatively younger, but you know, with that kind of developed family situation and things at the, at the time, but um, I would have been yeah, really happy to stay with that a bit. What changes have you noticed in, in politics and in the job of an MP over the last 14 years or so? Yeah, some, some real significant ones. I mean, the. The hardest bit has been the, the general kind of trust and I think esteem at which politicians are held in has, has declined. Um, I mean, let's be realistic. It's never, you know, yeah. politics is always going to be, I always kind of say people know if you're a politician, you've got to accept people probably don't like you as a, as a default position until you meet them and hopefully you'll give a, a more positive impression of what the whole thing is like. But, um, you know, that has been a, a factor and obviously, I mean, we've seen with Boris Johnson's prime minister, specific things like standards and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ethics in public life. So, so that bit has been hard. The, um, the big impact has been technology uh, yeah. on the job. I mean, I, I remember once I was talking, I think it was Ken Clark and I, I said, you know, what was it like when you started? I was in the 1970s when Ken was elected and he said, oh, you'd get like seven or eight letters a week. No one expected you to even reply to them. You know, so he said, someone said, said you know, even his own party tried to stop him up from a constituency office. <laughs> <laughs> Try and speak to his own, his own, you know, electorate. So in these days that the stuff coming in, in a good way is, is, I mean, in a week, I think we'd be looking at a couple of thousand communications, um, emails, tweets, letters. Again, I mean, I remember, I think I read something from Roy Hattersley, um, in 2010, when I was elected saying, you know, he remembers when he was first elected, if you wanted to kind of contact your constituency, you practically had to walk out of parliament and go to a phone box on parliament <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. now for a private conversation because they used to share offices. Now I can, I can pull out my phone, Facebook live, not just my constituents, but anyone yeah, who follows yeah. me and tell this is what I'm doing as well. So, so that bit is great, but it has come at a, at a cost. The other side of that is, you know, there's a lot more online abuse. I think female politicians get it much worse than, than, than male. 
Um, there's a resilience that is required there. I mean, my, my wife does a lot of political training. She uh, is a, she's the director of something called Labour Women's Network, which runs you know, one of our oh. kind of premium training programs um, for female candidates. And you know, I'm just really struck by how much of their work is about, you know, I remember political training 20 or 30 years ago. Was, this is how you write a press release. You know, this, yeah. is how you, this is how you get the attention of your local paper. Now we're much more about how will you manage your time, your personal resilience in the face of some of these pressures? How will you make sure that you are not um, mistaking activity for outcomes? Yeah. You can fill your diary with all sorts, but is, is it really delivering on what you want to deliver in this role? So it, it's changed a lot in that sense. Parliament's hours have changed quite a bit. I mean, there were 10 o'clock finishes on Monday and Tuesday when I started. Um, now only Monday has that because people know it starts at half two, so everyone can get to Parliament for every part of the country. So actually... The time-wise side of that has changed quite a bit. The big thing since the pandemic, because of the um, you know complete take-up of platforms like uh, Zoom and Teams, has been sometimes if constituents want to see you, they're really happy to do it, not just on a Friday or a Thursday night when you're home. They can you know yeah, do. Yeah. I, mean, I talked to a local um, uh, a group in my constituency yesterday because they wanted to do it via Zoom, so I could do it on, on a Wednesday. That's a, that's a real bonus. Yeah, it's a real yeah. change. I mean, it's never going to replace your classic Friday surgery visits to schools and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's, it, you know, it it, is, it, yeah. it's easy to communicate as an MP. I think that's uh, that's going to be a plus. Um, just on the Ken Clark stuff, if you ever get him talking about letters being sent, I think quite he got quite a few letters from Brian Clough um, complaining about immigration, <laughs> picking up on one of your earlier points and not being able to sign letters for Nottingham Forest. You should get him to tell you those stories. If, if you can, at such stage. Uh, well, what did your parents do? So my uh, dad was a fireman. Yeah. Uh, my mum uh, did various jobs in, in the main, you know, raised us as, as children, really around the shift patterns of the, of the fire brigade. Um, but she worked for uh, Provident, uh, the, the law school. Oh, yeah. It was my first economic uh, knowledge could come from, you know, the experience of seeing how that business worked and uh, what that meant. She was also uh, she was dinner lady for uh, a bit. And they actually met the two of them um, when they were... Uh, I think 16 year olds yes. um, at National Savings in Durham, which is a big, uh, big office, uh, was based there at the times from my dad decided to become uh, a fireman, so a firefighter, we should say. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, as that's changed a lot in yes. recent years. And yeah, I mean, so it was, I, mean, I often say, you, you mentioned that the Northeast and growing up there. I mean, I, I often say what, where I come from is, is the classic, you know, working class labor yeah. communities where um, it's not, yeah, you know, people talk about old and new labour, but actually, people got to understand when I'm talking about classic labour, I'm talking about work being the absolute centre of of working yeah. class life. You know, um, whether that was shipbuilding and, and mining or, or public sector jobs like being in the fire brigade, but the, the whole of family life. I mean, we would go on, you know, we'd have Christmas parties that were run by the fire brigade's union. We would go sometimes yeah. on holiday with, with yeah. fire brigade families like that. That really did shape it. And I remember, I said this to some people yesterday, a really powerful memories. Obviously, by brigade, day shifts, night shifts, days yeah. off. So actually means, you know, dad was, was around, uh, you know, home a lot, you know, I, cooking and things like that. There was no kind of, um, you know, some sort of old fashioned, you know, masculine division of labor, you know, really good yeah, role yeah. model for, for your dad, seeing him do that. I always remember, because what you never would want in a job like that is you didn't want your dad to be on day shift on Christmas day. Yeah. And they used to, oh, I think they still do it now. Firefighters, the older people with grown up children would volunteer to take the shifts. So people with young families could be home, you know, oh, against okay. the classic, uh, yeah, yeah. everything in your, in your family life is based around that. And it's, I mean, it's a, I read over the summer, uh, I, I, most of my like leisure reading is actually economic and history <laughs> and political books, but. Sometimes it's too much. And I love football, obviously, like a football manager anecdote. So I read Sir Alex Ferguson's biography, and he's got this great line in there where he says he always was amused when people, people would usually write things like, you know, Alex Ferguson's done so well for a, a guy in the shipbuilding mm. part of governing. He'd sort of think to himself, he says, you know, actually, how I do the job is because I can, I can relate to people. It doesn't matter if you're managing a, a pub as a professional footballer or, a, you know, at the end of his career some of the, the biggest yeah. names in world football, you know, it, it's not in spite, it's because of that background. And I, you know, I, I, is in many ways how I feel about doing the job as an MP, but also as shadow business secretary. Yeah. His book with, with Michael Moritz leading is, is particularly yeah. good, like to that business and thing. It makes a very interesting argument in there about footballers not being paid enough, which is, 
he actually makes very well, which I was not expecting when I sort of started, uh, started out on it. Um, what, what do you think the impact of AI will be on, on work and, and, and business? Have you played with much yourself, chat GPT? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is so significant. In some ways, you almost really have to ask, what, what will it not do? You know, yeah. is there anywhere it will not affect? I mean, first of all, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you ask, you know, chat GPT, write me a 500 word blog on mm. Labour's economic policies, it's astoundingly good. Yeah. I mean, it's better, better than some of the blogs you might read, <laughs> uh, the people have done. If you, I think I want by asked it, could you write me a poem about my constituency? Could I represent five, yeah. five towns, uh, Stillybridge, Hyde, Mosley, London, Dillon, and Duckenfield. And you know, brilliant. It yeah. was extraordinary. And obviously we're still at the early stage. For me, all this, by the way, I stopped in the optimistic position. Mm. I mean, I talked about the mills and the history of, of my constituency, you know, Luddism essentially <laughs> in a way response to, to some of that sm smashing the looms. I mean, look, history always tells us that we're quite right to fear disruption. How we manage that has to yeah, be carefully yeah. considered. But ultimately, there's always new forms of employment that actually can be even more fulfilling and successful and innovative because we've embraced that change. And so I, I think we've, we've got to see it in that way. We're right to be worried about, you know, if we got it wrong, what, what might it mean? I mean, it is now a situation where you, you can canvas people in your own constituency who've seen an image that's been manipulated and they believe it's real. Yeah. You've got to talk to them about that. It's clearly a world where you could, you could, you could watch a video of someone and it's not really them. Yeah. There's going to be a sort of a, for politics alone, a, a regulatory role there and how the electoral commission will, will do that. It goes back as well to that point around, you know, ultimately, why do you want good dialogue with businesses, whether you're the government or the opposition? Well, could you fix a problem like this without that genuine yeah. good faith dialogue and relationship? Could you get that right? You obviously want the UK to be a, a magnet for inward investment and a place to, to come and develop these ideas, but You've also got to make sure, you know, and I think a well-regulated environment is attractive. It's not, it's not a burden if you get it right. It's, it's an attractive reason to come here yeah. and do it. But I, I would say, try and summarize an incredibly fast moving position. I, I think people here in, in parliament, government, obviously, first of all, they're catching up a little bit with how quickly yes. and rapid <laughs> this has been. I was talking to someone in, uh, uh, you know, media recently, they're talking about video editing and how so much of it can now be done through artificial intelligence and, and keywords. And they said, to be honest, the only reason we're not using even more of it, because we're talking about people, a job that now that once took three months is, is now being able to be done in a few days. The only reason we're not doing more of it is we still need the senior people yeah. to ultimately review the product and they won't become senior and experienced enough yeah. unless they're doing some of it, you know, without the aid of that kind of technology. So it is going to be uh, profound, but again, I always remember at university, someone telling me they were going to set up a firm and go into what we would now know as search engine optimization yeah. you know, and, and, and online advertising. And I remember thinking, all right, maybe, you know, I mean, that, look at the size of that. Like, you yeah. know, most, even most politicians now in election will spend more online advertising than in, you know, the traditional yeah, yeah. leaflet and election address through the door. I mean, you, you never know. And if you, if you approach it with optimism, acknowledge the problems, but, but make sure we are, you know, trying to do this in a way which recognizes that change and innovation is always the basis of, of you know, progress. That's how we'll try and get it right. Have you ever had a business idea on that? Many times, because I get to, to see so many, you know, incredible people with their own history of you know, yeah. business that may be founded and exited, or if they have, um, you know, currently they're, they're talking about the stages of development they're going through. You are a little bit inspired to think, uh, you know, yeah, I've got yeah. some ideas and I would like, you know, not saying we're stealing anyone's ideas, by the way, if we come around, you're not going to see me resign from parliament and then <laughs> yeah. set up in, in opposition to that. But yeah, I mean, I think because especially I, you know, I didn't plan to become an MP in 2010, mm. maybe longer term was interested in it, but I, you know, then been almost a journey as the Labour Party has frankly sorted itself out in many ways and, and come back to be, I think, in a position to challenge for the next election. Obviously, I feel very much part of that story. In fact, coming back after the yeah. summer. Some people here, someone said to me, it's like the season finale almost as we, as we approach the end of this parliament, what, what's the outcome going to be? But I, I, you know, I'd like a part of my life where, you know, maybe I you know, get a chance to, to try things that are a bit different, yeah. you know, um, it's a pure honor to be absolute honor to be a member of parliament in any circumstances. But I, you know, these days we do live in a world where you can think about different careers and 
parts of it. So yeah, I keep a little set of ideas that I think you know, maybe, oh, right, okay, I mean, right. the, the world might be different in 10 years time oh, yes. if I uh, was in that position then to do it. But yeah, I mean, I, I, and I, I admire people who take the personal risk of developing some of those ideas. I, I think sometimes we, we need to acknowledge that's, you know, it's, it's harder to do that if you've got nothing to fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people doing it either a stage in their life, obviously they've got a family background that allows them to do that. So it's, you know, I feel like you're going back to that story about going back to, to law school. I mean, I had no margin for error. Yeah, yeah, right. Really. I admire people who take that risk, but in that situation, it wouldn't have been the reasonable thing for, for my family. And that's you know, why at that time that was so important to go in to get that training contract and, and do that. But if you're in a position later on in your life where you could do that. I, I do have a bit of theory that actually like a lot of entrepreneurs either come from the kind of upper classes so they can kind of like afford to take the time and the risk to do it or they come from the working classes where they have got much less to sort of lose anyway. So actually you have this sort of dearth of middle class entrepreneurship. Yeah. But um, what um, what would be your um, what would be your sort of dream job? I'm not talking politics. Sometimes when I ask politicians this, they get very sort of like as if I'm going to lead you into a coup on your leadership. But <laughs> not doing that. But it's like what would be your sort of Dream job, deep sea scuba diver. Yeah, I, I sometimes say that I used to dream of, you know, being a professional footballer and playing for Sunderland. Yeah. Now I dream of being like a non-exec director of the club. Probably <laughs> <laughs> sporting physique changes over time. But <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the relationship between economics and sport. And mm -hmm. um, you know, Sunderland have a model at the minute where we're developing younger players and selling them on. And I think yeah. that, that is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the intersection of quite a few different things, which is quite, um, which is quite uh, interesting. I'm also really interested in, I mean, if you look at one of the things that really, you really change the world. I mean, obviously governments, politicians, there are, there are international roles as well that, that, that have a role in that. But I also think, especially having been the shadow city minister for, for so long, mm. you know, people who are in charge of how capital is allocated, who have a say in that, whether that's in so the energy sector or fintech or whatever, that, that's, you know, asset management, that's a huge part of it. It's not as glamorous as, you know, sport or whatever, but that, that does. That is a yeah. big part of the story. I think, again, we've got to maybe tell the public more of a story about how the interplay of some of that stuff works, works. because the, the fact is it's in a, in a really positive way compared to 20, 30 years ago. There are a lot more countries around the world where, you know, a business might be thinking of investing yeah. capital because, you know, I mean, think back to, to even the end of the 70s and the early 80s. I mean, you've still got the division of Europe. You've got, you know, nothing like the kind of competition from the from the east that has changed a lot so we've got to understand yeah. that we've got to you know we're going to be competitive as a country in this completely um it, what's a favorite book or podcast or something you've listened to lately so in podcast terms i i love the rest is history um, yeah i have I, my, my degree was in history it was always a passion of mine i think how they how they do that and the output of them and, yeah, so yeah that's a high productivity podcast uh, yeah, yeah. uh Tom and Dominic there, they deserve uh, uh, some, uh, can help us to sell some productivity crisis. Credit for that. Oh, on books, I mean, I, I, I love um, political biographies. Um, again, they're dealing with similar things. I mean, I, yeah. um, probably the most recent one I read was Howard, the new one on Howard Wilson that my colleague Nick Thomas Simmons oh, yeah. wrote. I think it's, it's a, well, this is where that is. It's not just a kind of, you know, he did this, he did that. It's a, it's a different take on what that government meant responding to those okay. very significant challenges of of the of the 1970s. I just read Ed Conway's book, uh, Material World. Again, oh, yeah. great way to explain to people that about really some of the, you know, yeah. some of the processes and, 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 you know, supply chain issues they might not have been, um, familiar with. And I, uh, also just read, um, a book I've been meaning to read for years, which is the almost perfect people. It's, it's a book on Scandinavia and, you know, the kind of the perception that they often exist at. Everything is perfect in Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and uh, you know, it's South Finland's <laughs> education system. Everything will be fine. It, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a part book. Someone's passion is the, the Scandinavian culture and 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 you know the country, but you're a bit more skeptical on on some of that. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm always there's so much work things you have to read, but I I do obviously I have to travel between Greater Manchester and, and yeah. London every week, so you get some time to do some of that as well. So try and there's always a few emails to to reply to, but. Try and use that time for that. And actually, as a discipline, that's quite good. Yeah. Joy, thanks so much for coming on Jimmy's Jobs of the Future. It's been Absolute a pleasure. pleasure.